Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our message this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That's our text. Oh, when the saints go marching in. No one really knows the origin of that song, but Louis Armstrong made it famous in 1938. And later, Ella Fitzgerald and even Elvis Presley sang that song. When the saints go marching in is used at Mardi Gras, the day before Ash Wednesday. And also, when the saints go marching in is used at New Orleans Saints football games, every time the saints score. Today, we celebrate All Saints Day. And in our second reading, we heard a list of saints, kind of like a hall of fame of saints. First of all, I've got to tell you what a saint still living on this earth is not. A saint still living on this earth is not a perfect Christian. In fact, a saint still living on this earth isn't even necessarily an outstandingly great Christian. A saint is simply a person who is holy in God's sight because of Jesus. In other words, every Christian is a saint. The Apostle Paul addressed the churches like this, to the saints living in Rome, to the saints living in Corinth, to the saints living in Ephesus. The robes that we pastors wear every Sunday morning are symbolic of being in Christ. And we have another little one this morning who's wearing that white robe. All Christians are in Christ. When God looks at a Christian, he sees Jesus. That's what makes us saints. So believe it or not, you're looking at St. James. When we say the Apostles' Creed, we say, I believe in the Holy Christian Church, comma, the communion of saints. I wish they would erase that comma and put a hyphen in there because the Holy Christian Church is the communion of saints, the gathering of saints. All believers in Jesus who are already in heaven, we call the church triumphant. And those of us still living on the earth, still battling against sin and, the, and Satan, we are the church militant. When you look at the saints listed in Hebrews chapter 11, it's pretty impressive. Noah is one of those saints listed. Now, most of us know that Noah built a gigantic ark. He probably took a lot of ridicule building that on dry ground. But did you also know that after Noah got off the ark, he planted a vineyard, made wine, and got drunk? And think about Abraham. When God called Abraham to a new land, he picked up everything and left. He didn't even know where he was going. Impressive, but perfect? Well, not really. Two times, Abraham told half-truths about his beautiful wife, Sarah. One time he told it to Pharaoh in Egypt and another time to a king in Canaan. He said that Sarah was simply his sister. And then we hear about Isaiah and the prophets, many of whom were killed simply because they were telling the good news about God and the coming Messiah. Impressive. Were they saints? Yes. Were they perfect? No. The book of Hebrews was probably written during a time of persecution in the Christian church. In AD 64, under Emperor Nero, the city of Rome experienced a devastating fire, almost certainly an accidental fire, 
Kind of like when Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicked over the lantern in Chicago, causing the great Chicago fire. Now, if Nero had been wise, he would have rebuilt the city for those who had lost the most. But Nero wasn't wise. What he did was he cleared out the rubble and he built a gigantic palace for himself. Now, there was no internet back in those days, but the gossip was flying around Rome. They were putting two and two together. Nero did it. Nero burned the city. Well, Nero didn't burn the city, but he had to find a scapegoat. And that scapegoat turned out to be the Christians. Christians were captured and taken to the Hippodrome. Hippodrome is where they had horse races, a long U-shaped building. Hippo in Greek means horse. So a hippopotamus is a water horse. But that long U-shaped horse racing venue now had changed into a torture chamber for Christians. Christians were sent into the Hippodrome. Lions were released and the Christians were torn apart. Or Christians wore animal skins over their back and head. Wild dogs were released, biting those Christians to death. And on the outside perimeter of the Hippodrome were multiple crucifixions. It was like a hideous three-ring circus. And at night, maybe the worst thing of all, Christians were tied to poles. They spread tar over them and lit them to provide illumination for the nighttime activities. After a couple days of this, even the Romans had had enough. And the soldiers started offering Christians a choice. They said, if you'll go to the middle of the Hippodrome, if you'll look up into the crowd, and if you'll yell out, Jesus is a phony and a fake, we'll let you go. Now, folks, here's where advanced preparation is so necessary. If you go into a difficult or tempting situation and you haven't made up your mind what you're going to do, oftentimes you're going to compromise your Christian faith. That's why Joshua challenged his people coming into a new land, Canaan. He said, you're going to be faced with lots of false gods. He said, choose this day who you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Soldiers receive that kind of training before they go into battle. If they're captured by an enemy, they're trained not to give up information that would put their fellow soldiers in harm's way. Well, the Christians decided in advance what they would do. They would rather die than to lead others away from Jesus. The Christians went to the middle of the arena and they yelled out, the soldiers told me that if I'd yell out to you that Jesus is a phony and a fake, they'd let me go. I can't do that because Jesus loves me. Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sins. And then Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus has prepared a place for me in heaven. And if you'll trust in him, he'll save you too. And then the gates would open and the lions would be released. Let me read for you again today's text. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. The writer to the Hebrews is describing a stadium-like setting. I think he wanted those Christians to look up into the Hippodrome and see Abraham and Isaac, Jacob. Over there is King David, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, all cheering them on. And especially he wanted them to see Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. The writer to the Hebrews wanted those persecuted Christians to see the entire cloud of witnesses sitting up in the stadium, cheering them on. 
People like my brother John and like Pastor John Herzog, saints who have already crossed the finish line and are safely home with Jesus. I love the song that we sang today at the beginning of the service, For All the Saints. It starts out by talking about the saints who are already home in heaven, the church triumphant, the ones already who have received the crown of life. And then the song starts talking to us, the saints who are still living on this side of heaven, the church militant. The song encourages us to stick with Jesus, to fight for the faith as the saints did who nobly fought of old. The song continues to encourage us by saying, the golden evening that brightens in the west, soon, soon to faithful warriors cometh rest. Sweet is the calm of paradise the blessed. Alleluia. I think a lot about the saints in my life who have encouraged me and built me up. I think about my grandparents, faithful Christians. They didn't have much money. In fact, I didn't inherit a single thing physically from them. But they gave me something much more valuable. They gave me their Christian example. They gave me their Christian example of faithfulness to the Lord. I think about my parents who prayed for me every day, who had family devotions with me every day, who sent me to church and Sunday school every Sunday, who sent me to a Lutheran school. I think about pastors, teachers, and friends who encouraged me in my Christian walk. I remember one time when I was a young Lutheran teacher, I was in front of a group of people, about 100 people in a Bible class, and in walked a very well-known and respected pastor in the back of the back of the class. And I thought to myself, oh no, what did I say wrong? But when he raised his hand and I called on him, he didn't have a question at all. He just had a comment. He said, I hope you've been listening closely because everything that Jim just said is exactly right on. Whew. What a relief. Well, that saint is now in heaven, but he's part of the cloud of witnesses that still affects my life, even to this day. I recently listened to a podcast by Denzel Washington, and he said some profound things. He said, I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. He said, you can't take it with you. And then he said, it's not about how much you have. It's about what you do with what you have. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. This past week, I went to two funerals, one for my biological brother, John, and one for my brother in ministry, Pastor John Herzog. They were two people who made a difference on this earth for heaven's sake. They were loved by Jesus, and they reflected that love onto others. Their legacy lives on. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you have the opportunity to leave something behind that has everlasting value. You can witness to your family, your friends, your neighbors. You can tell them that your hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That on Christ, the solid rock you stand, that all other ground is sinking sand. You can pray for others, serve others, be an example for others. Maybe you can even do what our dear sister in Christ, Barb Asmus, did. Every three months, she passed out 20 portals of prayer to her friends at Lakeshore Senior Living. Today, we sang that beautiful song for all the saints. You know, I want the last verse of my life to be like the last verse of that song. From earth's wide bounds, from ocean's farthest coast, through gates of pearl, stream in the countless host, singing to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Alleluia. When the saints go marching in, 
When the saints go marching in, oh Lord, I want to be in that cloud of witnesses. When the saints go marching in. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which goes beyond human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.